Good morning. Good morning. Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to our Bible study. Uh, come on in, everybody. Good to see you. Good to see each and every one of you. As um, 646, this is the day that the Lord hath made, and we will rejoice in it. We'll just give us one more minute so persons can still log in. Please don't forget to do a watch a Facebook watch party so that we can tell our friends about what's going on here in our Bible studies. While you are yet uh, coming in, I uh, want to share something with everybody about this coming Sunday. This coming Sunday at 11 a.m., we've been talking about it for the entire month of March. And visitors, you are also welcome to come and be a part of our 11 a.m. service. Our theme for that service for that Sunday is to focus on three words, revive, restore, relieve. You may have gotten something in your email by way of an advertisement saying that the Righteous Church of God on the fourth Sunday at 11 a.m. will focus on revive, restore, and relieve. Relieve. So we're asking all of our friends and all of the listeners to please invite all of your friends and family, those that have not been with us for a while. I have reached out personally, to persons to have them come and be a part. We have been talking about strongholds for the whole month of March in our sermons and in Bible studies. So on this fourth Sunday, we want to um, <clears throat> talk about personal strongholds. We'll have a brief message on personal strongholds and persons that are with us will be in special prayer that God can help them to be released from any personal strongholds that they may have. So we're calling all of our persons, all of our millennials, all of our teenagers, everyone to come, family, persons, all of us, all of us are under attack by Satan and we need to be revived we need to know that we are restored and we can leave relieved knowing that God is still with us. So that's this coming Sunday at 4, I'm sorry, at 12 noon. One final remark. If you have any friends or persons in your contact list, you can send those, con those emails to us. And what we will do will add them to our email list and they too will get the information in their inbox about what's going on at the Righteous Church of God. So any emails, your friends, your contact list, you can just email those to us. You And what we will do is add them to our mailing list, send them information. And of course, they have the option to unsubscribe if they would like to. But this is our way of contacting our friends and our relatives about what's going on. We have the Bible study going out. We have Good Friday coming up. We have the Monday uh, Lenten service and all the things that's going on. We want our community to know what we are doing. So tonight, we want to look at how we can have victory over the demonic strongholds that are in our lives. Father God, bless us now, we pray in the name of Jesus, amen and amen. Don't know about you, but I'm excited about what the Lord has been doing for this month of March. We've been fasting every Tuesday for our family, for our friends, and I keep saying this again, don't forget to invite them to service. What we're trying to do is to let them know that they're loved. Let them know that God has not forgotten them. Let them know that it's nothing that they have done that they can't get a reconciliation by God. 
Many persons feel that God has forgotten them. There's no hope. We need to let them know life happens, but it's no need for them to stay away from the fellowship of the saints or to break their daily devotions with God. That is one of Satan's strongholds. That is one of his main tricks, is to have persons feel that they're unforgiven, to have persons feel that it's no use, to have persons feel that you've been too bad or your past is too, um, too evil. And Satan begins to play on the mind and what he winds up doing is having us believe that there's no place, there's no fellowship, that God doesn't love us. So what they do, they stay away from their devotions, they stay away from church, they stay away from anything having to do with God because Satan has had them in a stronghold and having them believe that you're useless, you're worthless, and God doesn't love you. We need them to come to church on Sunday so we can pray for them and with them so they can know that they can be restored and renewed and revived. So tonight, um, and by the way, when we look at revive, our scripture for revive is, though I walk in the midst of trouble, thou will revive me. That's Psalm 138 and 7. That's our scripture for revive, which is one of the three theme words for this coming Sunday. Revive. Psalm 138.7 Though I walk in the midst of trouble, thou will revive me. That's revive. Then there's the word restore. Once we're revived, he wants to restore us. And that's Psalm 51, 12. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. In other words, make me happy. Make me joyful again that I have received salvation. And the final word is relieve. Relieve. In my distress, I cried unto the Lord, and he heard me. That's Psalm 120, verse 1. I was relieved because in my distress, I called unto the Lord, and he heard me. That's our theme words for this fourth Sunday, and we want persons to come to know these have them feast on it. Let them know that they are loved. So how can we have victory over Satan, over the strongholds? We talked about um, demonic groupings. We sent it out on last week on all the demonic groupings. And as you look at those groupings, we find that many of us have characteristics or traits that fall into that demonic grouping family. In essence, in all of us, there is some sort of weakness in us that falls into one or more of the demonic groupings. What Satan does, he attacks the weakest link of us which is one of the demonic groupings that we talked about. Give you a for instance. So in our fallen nature, because we're sinful by birth, it's easy. We are easy prey for Satan to attack our weaknesses. So if one of our weaknesses happen, happen to be bickering or quarreling or fighting, if that's one of our weaknesses, Satan will target that in us and amplify that. And that's how he gets a foothold or a stronghold into us. So we don't want anyone to think that because we have that demonic grouping list, that you look at that list and say, oh my gosh, 
I am horrible. I am demon possessed. I am full. No, the purpose of it is so that we can be aware. Our weaknesses is what Satan wants to attack. And when he attacks it, he amplifies it, traps us in a stronghold, and there he has his way with us of stealing our joy. But let me go back again. One of the things that can help us to prevent or overcome strongholds, we must believe two things. Number one, Satan cannot make the believer do anything. Satan can't make us. Satan can't make us. We are tempted when we are drawn away by our own lusts. Satan can entice us, but he cannot force us to sin. He can entice us. And he cannot take away our salvation. We need to remember that. We are born into the family of God. And he that the sun sets free, we're free. He has sealed us to the day of redemption by his Holy Spirit. So we are in Christ. Now, having known that, our salvation is secure. And we need to remember that because Satan wants, one of his traps are, is to have us think that we are not saved. To have us think that God really doesn't care. But that's a trap. And when we, when he attacks one of the characteristics of the demonic groupings that we talked about, he attacks it and then he amplifies it. Then we begin to feel that we are not saved. And that's how he works. Now, in this world, it's possible, <coughs> excuse me, it's possible for us to have some victories. We'll have some victories. The reason why I say some victories, it's because we can overcome one victory, overcome one sin or one fault or one stronghold, but Satan doesn't leave us alone. He comes back. And when he comes back, he tries Again, if you remember, when Jesus was out in the wilderness, he was tempted by Satan, and he defeated Satan with the word of God. This is right after he was baptized. And after Jesus defeated him three times with the scripture, the Bible says Satan departed from him, but for a season. You see, that's in John. After Jesus said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord God in vain. When he rebuttaled Satan with the word, Throw yourself down, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God, turn these stones into bread, if thou be the Christ. He threw words out. Jesus refuted those with scripture and once satan was defeated by the word of god after being tempted the bible says satan left him but for a season and that should tell us even though we conquer one victory we conquer one stronghold we have victory all it means is you got over that one, but we can't let our guard down. We still have to continue to pray because Satan will return. So there are some steps we have to take. We have to understand, that's number one, we have to understand our enemy. We got to understand who he is. We got to know how he works. We got to understand. We got. He takes advantage of persons that don't know the word, or he will take the word and twist it in such a way to make it 
sound like scripture and if we don't know it, then we fall prey to his traps. So we must understand the enemy. He comes to kill and to destroy. He comes described or he comes disguised as an angel of light. He comes looking like an angel. He comes looking like a good fellow. He disguises himself as if he were an angel of light, like I'm bringing you good news in the garden. He disguised himself. Sure, Eve, you can take this. You're going to be knowledgeable. He twists the word. And if we're not careful, we will fall prey. So we got to understand the enemy. It says in Ephesians, we got to put on the whole armor of God that we can stand against the demonic schemes of the devil. He takes advantage of the, the spiritually immature or the weak Christians. We said on Sunday when when a lion is seeking food in a herd of deer or elk or, or zebras, he, he attacks, but he attacks the weakest one. He attacks. So then we got to know Satan's methods. We got to understand who he is, but we must understand his methods, how, how he works. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians, we cannot be ignorant of his devices. At 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11, we must know his methods. We cannot be ignorant. Now, if we have fallen sometime in the past or recently, you realize you got trapped got up, made it through, God forgave you. We need to remember that. So the next time we are tempted in such a way, we got to say, wait a minute. You got me last time. I know your devices. And he will come disguised to try to trap us again. So the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians, we cannot be ignorant of his devices. He'll use friends. He'll use business partners. He'll use financial schemes. He will use many things to disguise and to trap us. We got to know his methods. And to know his methods, we have to know the word of God. And God reveals to us, which leads me to the third point. We've got to test the spirit. We have a responsibility. It tells us in 1 John 4.11 to test the spirits to see if they are of God. Because there are false spirits, false people that went out unaware. So it tells us in 1 John 4.11, if somebody comes or something comes to you, is this, is that, don't worry about that, do this. It tells us in 1 John, no matter how good it sounds, test the spirit by the spirit you have in you, which is of God. God, is this what you want me to do? Is this for real? Are you really working in me to do this? It sounds good to me. God, help me test the spirit of the demon that's trying to get you to do what he wants. And it tells us to test the spirit. In other words, it's always levels of temptation. The temptation isn't the problem. It's yielding to it. And it can sound good and look good, but we have to test the spirit by the spirit. That's 1 John 4 and 1. 4 and 1. So always be careful of what looks good and sounds good. But if we don't test it, all we got is this, Lord, is this of you? Is this what you want me to do? Is this your will for me? Should I do this? It sounds good to me. I'm in need of whatever they're telling me I'm going to get. If you want me to do this, help me to pray about it. And God will give you peace one way or 
the other. That's how you test the spirit. Satan doesn't like when we do that. We have to be actively watching. That's number four. Satan is busy. And it tells us in 1 Peter 5, 8, be sober, be watchful. We know this. The adversary, the devil, is like a roaring lion. And it says walking about. So we can't say the devil is everywhere at the same time. The devil isn't. It tells us he walketh about, seeking who he may devour. But let me make a parallel there. Now remember, we have a fallen, sinful nature. And many times we say, the devil made me do it. I'm not going to deny that the devil didn't make you do it. But many times, many times, it's us that gets us in trouble. And we can't blame everything on the devil because something we want to do wrong and some things we allow ourselves to get entrapped. And we say the devil made me do it as a sidebar. Since we have fallen nature, and maybe there's an area in our life that we haven't really turned over to God yet. We're working on it. And maybe Satan knows the area that we're going to turn over, but it hasn't happened yet. He comes in, takes that weak part. Then we find ourselves drifting to an area of a stronghold. Many times it's us that's leading us. One of my prayers is, Lord, rescue me from me because I am my biggest problem. Now, of course, the devil can do things, but the Bible says he walketh about seeking who he may devour. So he's not everywhere at the same time, according to 1 Peter 5 8. But when he does try to get in number five to overcome strongholds, we got to resist him. When he comes, the Bible says in James 4, 7, resist the devil and he will flee from you. So how do you resist the devil? We got to resist the idea. We got to stand on our ground. We got to tell him, Satan, get thee behind me. It says in 1 John 2.13, he says, I'm writing unto you because you must have conquered the evil one. That's 1 John 2.13. It says that we have and can conquer the evil one. So how do we resist the devil? You know what's interesting about human nature? All of us know. We know when something is not right. We know that if I do this, this is going to happen. We have a God consciousness. We know that, I'll make it simple. We know if we're going to, I'm going to make this up. We know if we rob a bank, we're going to get caught sooner or later. We know it's wrong from the beginning. That's why the scheming and that's why the ducking that's why the, the hiding, because we know it's not right. We know that thought is not godly, but we must resist the thought. That's how you resist the devil. You got to say, oh, no, 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 no. That sounds good, but I'm not going to do it. And then we got to pray that God will give us strength. So this whole bit about resisting the devil is really where the believers we really need to really lock in on because resisting the devil can be a challenge you know why because it sounds so easy to drift that way it's so nice to follow the path it's really feels good to go after what he's offering us and that resistance comes from a stance 
that we must take and believe. And we need to follow our God consciousness. We know that it's wrong. Or we know that God's not pleased. And to do it anyway, then there's consequences. You don't have to, let me say it another way, I'm going to move on. Um, if Nate Butler decides that he is going to, I'm going to be very obvious, if I'm going to go out and steal a car, I know it's wrong. The person stealing the car knows it's wrong. Why? They have a God conscious. They know it's wrong. They duck, they plan, they scheme. It's a nice car. If you get away, you got a nice ride. But if we resist it, it says, I will not, the devil will flee. That's what the Bible says. Resist the devil and he will flee. I know that's good talking stuff. I know that's easy to say. You look at somebody that's chemically dependent or somebody that's abusive or somebody is going through something and you're going to tell that person, look, don't, don't take no more drugs, don't take no more of this. It's hard for them to get a hold of that because they're in the stronghold. We need to protect our youth now. We need to teach them how to resist the devil now, to stay away from harmful people, harmful things, harmful places. We got to teach them now, not when they get trapped. Now, not that there's no hope, but once the devil gets a hold and a stronghold, it takes a lot of prayer to break the strongholds. So we got to realize, uh, six, we got to realize our own weaknesses. We got to realize we can never say what we're never going to do. We got to realize our areas of weaknesses. This is how you resist. You got to know where your weakness is. And I could talk about that a while, but you can get the idea. If you know you have a proclivity or you know you have a, 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 a sense of a particular area of weakness, you, you know it. If you know that and, and, and you don't want to do certain things because it lead to something else, we got to know what our weakness and our weak areas are. Certain people we shouldn't hang around because we're weak. Certain things we shouldn't do or come close to because we're weak. I was in a situation one time and I was in this particular church and I'll just tell you, I'll just tell you the story. I'll just tell you. We were in church and at and, and communion, um, they serve real wine. I mean, it wasn't but a thimbleful of real wine. And um, after a while, somebody approached the leadership and said, look, uh, you can't serve wine because I know that you're serving it, the purpose of it and all of that. But, but we have people in the congregation that are recovering addicts. They're going through the withdrawal process or whatever. And just the smell of this wine all over the room, it's, and they know that's a weakness for them. They don't want to be around it because it'll draw them back to the past. Well, make a long story short, the church decided, yeah, you're right, they didn't do it anymore. But I was an example of that person knew their weakness, and if they hung around long enough, they would drift back. We have to know our weakness. Guys, we got to know our weaknesses. Ladies, we must know our weaknesses. We got to stay away from things that will entrap us. We want to look good, men, ladies. But remember, you might have confidence in how you look, but there's always somebody looking at you that are not as strong as you. I know that's not your fault, your problem, but we must be aware. 
we must be aware of our weaknesses and what effect it has on someone else. And number eight, we can't do it in our own strength. In Jude 9, when the archangel came to protest the body of Moses, Jude says, he says, the Lord rebuke you. We've got to know it's not in our own strength, but it's in the strength of God. Number eight, we've got to avoid some situations. And this is a little redundant. We've got to avoid certain situations. Um, the Bible says evil communications. People that don't have your lifestyle. We've got to avoid the situations that would cause us to drift that would cause a part of our weakness to be exposed if our weakness is exposed satan takes advantage of it comes in boom there's a stronghold and many persons in the past have gotten hooked on drugs or alcohol or some chemical or hooked on burglary or car thieving only because they hung out with a crowd didn't mean to do it, but they got caught up. And when they robbed the bank, the guy was driving the car. He gets time in jail as if he robbed the bank, which means some situations we got to stay away from. Some people we have to stay away. We got to avoid the situation. We got to separate ourselves, not in a self-righteous way, but if we see that the lifestyle is contrary to what we're trying to get away from, even if they're our friends, we got to avoid those situations. Evil, <coughs> excuse me, evil communications corrupt good manners. I had a friend of mine one time, he's a butler, he says, you know, since I've been saved, I'm going to just go witness to everybody. And I'm just going to tell them about Christ. So I said, so what you going to do? He said, oh, man, I'm, I'm going back. I'm going back to the crack house. I'm going back to the bar hall. And I'm going to tell all those people they need to repent and get their life together. I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. When you're going, you just been saved a week or two weeks. He met good. So what we did was say, wait a second. We'll get some prayer warriors to go with you. We'll get persons that have been in the faith and stronger. Persons that are skilled in witness to these type of people. Because when we alone go in these places and we say, we're going to change them. It's only one of you against a, a room full of demonic spirits. And if you're not spiritually strong enough, those spirits will jump on you because you or me don't have enough word in us to resist the devil. So there's nothing wrong with having a zeal to go back, but we need to go back with some prayer warriors. We need to be fasting because once you get there, it, the past of what you used to do will come back and we'll find ourselves becoming weak again. So... We got to avoid some situations. Now, this is a little, this is a little um, extreme. This is a little extreme. <laughs> this, this example here, um, when we were growing up, <laughs> you know, I hated this, and I'm just going to kind of say it. We, um, well, our, okay, our leadership at that time when we were growing up, they did not want us to fall in what they call a situation. And I could never understand it, to give an example. If two people wanted to go to the movie, our leadership at that time said, nah, you, you can't go by yourself. So they call themselves 
keeping us from avoiding a situation that we could get into and fall into a stronghold trap by Satan. So they're going to put somebody with us. Well, you know how that went. We just paid off the chaperone. <laughs> and, 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 and what happened was, what they didn't want to happen, happened. People can't manufacture a condition to keep us or to keep you. If we are going to do right, we don't need a third person to keep us. We must be strong enough in the word of God. And what they were trying to do was keep us from danger until we got strong enough. So I could understand it. So they're trying to protect us from situations and wanted us to be teenagers, etc., but also didn't want us to fall into traps. Well, make a long story short. We came through, God protected, not because of what they did. It's because in us, we knew what was right or wrong. And my father used to tell us all the time, and this is, uh, maybe I'll, I'll leave you on this one. My father would tell us in his scripture, can a man take fire into his bosom and not be burnt? Now that's a scripture, I'm not, not sure where it is, but he told us all the time, you're not as strong, Nathan, as you think you are. I was memorizing scripture, I'm 18, 19, you know, gun ho, blah, blah, blah. He says, your nature will fail you because your gift will put you in places where your flesh cannot keep you. I'm going to say like the old preachers. I said something there. Our gift puts us before people where our flesh cannot keep us. So he was trying to say, no matter how much word you know, some situations you're going to have to avoid because you're not spiritually strong enough. And that's what happens a lot of time with persons. Our gift does make room for us, and that's Bible. But when we, it says, we'll make room for you and put you before great and mighty people. That's what the Bible says. Your gift will make room for you and put you before great and mighty people. But if we are not spiritually strong, the situation that we're putting in front of us, if we're not strong, if it's a wrong situation, it'll entrap us. Some situations if we're not careful, can lead us to a demonic stronghold. So, we got to put on a whole armor of God, and we all pretty much know this. We got to put on a whole armor of God. We're in, we in a battle. We're fighting. You know, this is a real battle here. So, with all the things we said, in order to be victorious, we've got to put on the whole armor of God. This is in Ephesians and we know it well. It tells us that we have to put on the full armor. We got to have the belt of truth. And that just means we have to have the true word of God. And since Satan is a liar, we've got to know exactly what the word says, the belt of truth, so that we can defeat him with the word, the belt of truth, girded, it's a part of us. Then we've got to have the breastplate of righteousness. We've got to know what's right. We've got to know to do the right thing. The blessed breastplate of righteousness. I'm girded with my loins about me, but I'm the belt of truth, but I also have to put on the breastplate of righteousness. I've got to do right. 
I've got to do the right thing. The breastplate of righteousness. I've got to do the right thing. Then we got to have the shoes, the proper shoes, foot shod. In other words, our feet have to have the word of God so that when we go places, we go where the word of God tells us to. Foot shod with the preparation. Our feet need to go places to spread the gospel with the right word with truth and we go and we tell the word of God and we got to have the shield of faith because the shield protects us as Satan fires darts with us the shield will protect us and by faith we believe that they will not affect us <laughs> then there is the helmet of salvation it's got to protect our head our head the helmet of salvation we know that we've been delivered the helmet of salvation Satan wants to get into our head and have us think that we're not saved we've got to have the helmet of salvation then we have to have the sword of the spirit it's our offensive weapon it's where we are fighting the shield protects us, but the word or the, sh or the sword of the spirit allows us to deflect and to def defeat because we have a weapon. Sword of the spirit. All that's in Ephesians, and we pretty much know that. We must, number nine, we must have a constant communication with God. We can't just call on God in a crisis. We have to have a constant communication. It says in Ephesians 6, 18 that to pray all times. We have to pray all the time, talking to God on a basis. And we got to realize, number 10, that we are in the family of God. You are in. We are in the family of God. We're family. And we're in God's family. So with this, our armor on. And, and we're defending ourselves, we're defeating the enemy. That doesn't mean sometimes we lose something here or there. But First John tells us that we confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. None of us are perfect. All of us have cracks and flaws. All of us are fighting our level of stronghold. But we are winning. We are winning. Why? Because we rest in the promises of God. We rest in the promises of God. We rest. And it says in Psalm 9115, you might want to write that one down. Psalm 9115, this is one promise I hold on to all the time as we leave. Psalm 9115, he shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. Psalm 9115. This is our promise to God. I shall call upon him. God will answer me. And God says, I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver and honor him. Thank you, God, for being with us tonight. Thank you for the one promise. There are many, but thank you for 9115 Psalm. Help us, God, to realize that we are more than conquerors. We have the victory in the name of Jesus. Help us to walk in our anointing. Walk with our heads up high, knowing that we can overcome. We have overcome. We have broken the stronghold. We have victory in the name of Jesus. God bless you, people of God. Our prayer conference call starts right now in Jesus' name.